You want a war? You're gonna get one. Now get the guns, the drugs, from my generation, I'll take the fall. Welcome back to Reliving the War and welcome to the 18th of May 1998. Raw comes from Nashville, Tennessee, an absolute hellscape for Steve Blackman, and Nitro comes from Providence, Rhode Island. WCW only have 60 minutes on the air tonight, around 45 minutes if we cut out commercial breaks, so this is going to be a shorter episode of Reliving the War this week unfortunately, but it's going to be like the old days I guess. The NBA playoffs continue to cause WCW a lot of problems in terms of viewership, but next week we're back on track thankfully. This week though, we'll look at Raw's unopposed R first before comparing the head to heads. Check out the Slamboree video if you haven't done so already, or if it hasn't been destroyed by YouTube's giant robot monster, and check out this week's Jam Up Guy. Greg Penna met the hardcore legend Mick Foley recently while wearing his jammy shirt. Mick Foley has the jam, and clearly so does Greg. If you're looking for a shirt by the way, go to WrestlingBios.com and follow the link there. I'm having some issues with the lousy stinking hyenas who sold me the chinlocks domain, as in I didn't renew it on time. So use WrestlingBios.com for now and I'll get chinlocks back ASAP. Speaking of Mick Foley, dude loves involved in our first Raw promo, so let's get started with Reliving the War episode 134. Raw kicks off with Vince McMahon, Gerald Briscoe and Pat Patterson walking to the ring to cut a promo. Vince grabs a microphone and he says it's rumoured that Steve Austin suffered a concussion after taking that devastating clothesline last week from Vinnie Mac. McMahon says there's a good chance that Stone Cold will try to get some revenge tonight on Raw, I think that's pretty much guaranteed, but Vince says the injuries Austin sustained last week would be nothing compared to what the three ninjas here will do to Stone Cold here in Nashville. So Vince is taking the liberty to bar Steve Austin from the arena. This is for Stone Cold's own protection protection from Vince McMahon, it's fantastic. Vince shows us a video of Austin trying to get into the arena earlier on, the security guy breaks the news to Austin and Stone Cold says he could have a field day with this little 215 pound chump, but because Stone Cold's in a good mood, he's gonna go back to his pickup truck, drink a few Steve Weisers and he'll give this guy a little time to think about what he wants to do. Security Sam can do this the easy way or the hard way. Do you understand me? Yes sir. Say yes sir Mr. Austin. Yes sir Mr. Austin. You're damn right. Back in the arena, Dude Love gets welcomed to the ring by Vince, and Foley says, as we approach over the edge, that Dude Love is only getting stronger, looking younger, more handsome, and more educated. Dreams will come true on May 31st. Patterson and Briscoe's dreams come true when they ring the bell and announce that Austin's reign is over. McMahon's dreams come true when his strong but sensitive hand hits the mat for the 1, 2, 3. And Dude Love's dreams come true when he wins the WWF Championship. Vince then calls out Dustin Runnels and Dustin gets a good reaction on his way to the ring. Vince says Dustin blames him for all his problems, but it's not McMahon's fault that Dustin has a dysfunctional family. If Dustin wants to throw gold dust away and try to prove himself all over again, then he can wrestle Dude Love tonight even though Dustin has a bad knee. If Dustin wins, he can face Austin at Over the Edge instead of Foley, but if Dustin loses, then for 30 days he'll work for WWF without getting paid. Dustin accepts and he wants to start right away, so he cheap shots Dude Love. The Stooges and Foley fight back and Dustin manages to escape, so it looks like the one on one match is gonna take place a little later on Raw. Backstage, Jerry Lawler's hiding someone underneath a blanket, and no, it's not an underage, uh, let's not go there. He tells whoever this is to be inconspicuous and don't draw attention to themselves. Yeah, because walking around with a blanket over your head won't draw any attention whatsoever. Security Sam wants to make sure this isn't Stone Cold Steve Austin. He takes a quick look and it's definitely not Stone Cold. After a commercial break, Jerry loses this mystery man or girl or very young girl, but the mystery blanket person was just phoning the Ross Report to get the latest WWF scoops. Everybody, here comes the Hulk Hogan! He's coming from fucking Blasto! They say, who is it? 
Too Cold Scorpio faced the debuting Val Venus next in the vignettes worked, Val got a great reaction on his way to the ring and his whole entrance would remind you of Ravishing Rick Rude, only way more sleazy. The chicks dig Val Venus though and Val Venus digs these kind of chicks. He gets welcomed to WWF Raw with a clothesline from Scorpio but he comes back with a shoulder block before the two stall for a bit. They then play it safe with some wrist lock counters but Scorpio uses the ropes to flip over and Venus takes a standing sidekick. The big Valboski counters with a hammerlock and a back elbow in the corner. He delivers two running clotheslines before firing up and hitting a ton more while Scorpio can't move. We see a power slam from Venus followed by some gyrating that makes the ladies squeal but it did absolutely nothing for Scorpio unfortunately. Too Cold gets up and he hits his spinning front kick, Val replies with a clothesline but his aerial attack gets countered when Scorpio gets a boot up. We see one more spinning front kick from Too Cold Scorpio and then Scorpio changes direction in mid air while performing a top rope splash. Scorpio can't put Venus away though, Val performs a German suplex before getting his wee Valboski smashed on the top turnbuckle, but Venus is able to beat his opponent when Scorpio misses a moonsault. Val delivers his money shot finisher and I'd say this was a pretty successful debut. Val Venus wasn't bad at all in the ring and the crowd reacted well so yeah good job. Steve Austin approaches security Sam again and Sam's still not letting Austin through, so it appears our security providing hero wants to do things the hard way. Stone Cold attacks Sam and he grabs his radio, he asks for some medical assistance to come over and help this guy out before also sending a warning to Vince McMahon. Stone Cold's coming after the boss. The glass shatters and Austin walks down to the ring, he doesn't want to mess around tonight, he just wants to fight Vince McMahon, Jerry Briscoe and Pat Patterson. He calls Vince and the Stooges out and Vince can't believe that Austin just broke into his arena. McMahon wonders who Steve Austin thinks he is and Stone Cold says he's the man looking at three jackasses dressed up in suits. McMahon confirms that Austin wants a 3 on 1 street fight tonight on Raw, Patterson says he's up for it, Briscoe will do anything for Mr. McMahon and Austin can't help but laugh at these two acting like tough guys. So Vince says this street fight will happen but it's gonna be 2 on 1. Vince doesn't reveal which two of the three musketeers it's gonna be but Austin will be in action later tonight. Following this we get another Edge vignette, another cryptic load of nonsense about Edge heading to the horizon and mysteries of life unfolding, it's not worth playing honestly. Jerry Lawler's secret blanket person's getting some makeup applied backstage and Jerry says that isn't necessary. Whoever this is, their job is to protect the king tonight on Raw. We end the first hour with a Terry Funk vs Mark Merrow match but before it begins Sable says she's gonna let bygones be bygones after she broke her husband's back with that Sable bomb. Sable wants a clean split from Marvelous Mark and she wants to leave her man for good. Merrow says nope not happening, she signed a contract 2 years ago that says she will do whatever Mark says, Sable is Merrow's property, what kind of contract is that? So Sable's gonna get out of the ring, get in Mark's corner and she's gonna shut her mouth. Sable has no choice so she watches Mero take on Terry Funk. As usual Mero hits a low blow, Sable jumps on the apron to complain about her own husband, Mark hits a TKO but the referee's too busy with Mrs Mero so Terry Funk wakes up, Mero takes a DDT and Terry Funk wins the match, Sable seems pretty happy about the outcome. Eric Bischoff cuts a promo to begin Nitro while the Legion of Doom take on the DOA next on Raw. Bischoff's wearing a king's crown while sitting on a motorbike in the middle of the ring and Eric says it's good to be king. He says he's been looking back at the past 100 weeks and his professional television record is 92-0 against WWF. That number is incorrect by the way, it's 97-3 but I too wouldn't count that week where Nitro was split into two shows over Monday and Tuesday so I'd give it a pass. Bischoff says his in-ring record is 2-0, he defeated Larry Zbysko and he defeated Vince McMahon last night. Bischoff called Vince out and he wanted a proper fight but seeing as Vince didn't show up then Eric has to take the win. So now Eric looks to the future. Bischoff says he's gonna chase the dream, a dream that started at Slamboree last night. He thanks everyone for being part of one of the greatest nights of his life and that's the end of the promo. So wait, what's the dream he was gonna chase? He didn't explain that part but anyway. Anyway, there's a fan holding up a sign that says McMahon would kill Bischoff and these guys over here are holding up a giant WWF banner. 
On Raw's War, the critically acclaimed DOA vs LOD 2000 rivalry continues on, and you best believe that Hawk and Animal are gonna look out for the old switcheroo, but it's easy to tell one backer Michael Lacker from another, so all the LOD have to do is make sure there's no tomfoolery at the end of the bout. Guess what happens? Go, guess, guess how it ends. Do you think the DOA won after 8ball jumped in the ring to replace Skull? Of course they did. Hawk and on. <laughs> Hawk and Animal stand around afterwards as if to say, Ugh, I didn't see that one coming. But they do say they want a six man tag next week on Raw. The DOA don't need to worry about who the Legion of Doom's partner is going to be, so I guess that's one way to stop the constant switcheroos. Two things here before moving on. One, Sonny did not come to the ring with Hawk and Animal. And two, the LOD worked badly as a team, as in they were booked to wrestle badly. So it looks like a story is going to develop soon that includes. Talk an animal may be breaking up, who knows. We've got Perry Saturn vs Psychosis on Nitro and Dustin Runnels vs Dude Love on Raw. We see Perry Saturn cutting a pre-match promo and he talks a whole lot of sense when he says Glacier didn't invent the cryonic kick, it's just a basic sidekick that's been around for years. He then says Glacier's a joke, a reject based on a video game, and Glacier should watch Perry Saturn's matches to see how a real super kick's performed. If Glacier doesn't like it, he can come find Perry anytime he wants. With this promo, Saturn became the greatest wrestler of all time and I think he deserves a world title shot. Saturn doesn't get a match with Hulk Hogan, but he does get a match with Psychosis, and Psychosis gets his head kicked in at the beginning of the match. Saturn gets his receipt in the form of a spinning wheel kick, but he still manages to shove Psychosis off the top rope. Saturn then takes a drop kick while in mid-air, and Psychosis again goes for a corner attack, successfully drop kicking Perry out of the ring and performing a dive over the top rope afterwards. When it gets back inside the rope, Saturn pulls off a dragon suplex, and it looks like Psychosis landed on his head. It's pretty nice nasty, and hopefully Glacier was watching backstage because Perry then delivers a super kick. He goes on to plant Psychosis with his Death Valley driver, and the rings of Saturn leads to Perry winning the match via submission. Fair play to WCW for pushing Saturn a bit on TV, he's a great performer in the ring and it's good that he's breaking out in WCW more than his flock teammates. Over on Raw, we learned that Paul Bear and Kane took DNA tests to see if Big Daddy Paul is really Kane's, uh, Big Daddy. Check out Kane right here, there's boys that run about like that all the time where I come from, majority of them would probably need a DNA test too. Jerry Lawler then brings down his mystery blanket person and he says this guy here is going to protect him from attacks, just like the one last week from The Undertaker. The blanket comes off, it's Al Snow, and it sounds like Al only agreed to do this if he can get a meeting with Vince McMahon. Lawler realises this isn't gonna work, what with Snow losing his mind on commentary and all that, so he gets sent to the front row where he can stand by and wait for anyone who wants to beat up Jerry Lawler. Dude Love takes on Dustin Runnels inside the ring and it's a short one unfortunately. We've got a new aggressive Dustin Runnels here and he's all over Foley after the opening bell. Dude Love falls out of the after taking a ton of strikes, but the McMahon Stooges have shown up and this can't be good. Foley attacks the injured knee on the outside and Dustin gets his head rocked on the ring steps. Though back in the ring, the former Goldust pulls off his low uppercut followed by a clothesline and a bulldog. Jerry Briscoe then gets on the apron, Dustin gets distracted and Dude Love applies the mandible claw for the win. This means Dustin has to wrestle free of charge for 30 days. We see a close up of Dude Love's new and totally legitimate tattoo. Vince must be so proud. Stone Cold watched this match back in his locker room, and afterwards Austin was approached by two cops who informed him that he was under arrest. We come back from a commercial break and Team McMahon have arrived to watch Stone Cold get scooped. Vince is rubbing it in, he's telling Austin he shouldn't have attacked security Sam and he should have stayed away for his own good. But Austin says the cops will have to let him go sooner or later and when they do, Austin's coming back to get Vince. The Headbangers take on Kai and Tai next on Raw, on Nitro, Roddy Piper cuts a promo. The commentators on Nitro remind us about what happened during the Bret Hart vs Randy Savage match at Slamboree while this fan holds up a sign right here. I'm not sure if that's accurate to be fair, but you be the judge. The Hot Rod then comes out to discuss the match he officiated last night and he says he never wants to referee a match ever again. Last night was way too tough, but he does want to talk to Macho Man Randy Savage face to face. Piper tells Savage that he won't apologize for Slamboree, but he watched the tape and Piper admits that he didn't see Hulk 
Hulk Hogan coming down, and he didn't know it was Bret Hart who hit him from behind. So the match decision has been reversed. Piper announces that Macho Man Randy Savage is now the winner via disqualification. Bret Hart shows up and he's not happy. He thinks Savage and Piper are working together and this is the only way Randy could ever get a win over the hitman. So Savage says it can all get settled right now if Bret wants to step into the ring. Bret has no problem walking down that ramp because he has enough jam to take on both these bozos, but the hitman gets stopped by Hollywood Hogan. The WCW champ has a better idea. Bret and Hulk could have so much more fun if they team up to face Savage and Piper at the Great American Bash. Bret says he likes that idea. The baby faces still want to fight right now though, so Eric Bischoff has to hold Hogan and Bret back because Eric Bischoff has really big muscles and he's powerful enough to stop these two titans from getting into a physical altercation. So we have got our first match at the Great American Bash, Bret Hart teaming up with Hulk Hogan. Not what we wanted just a few weeks ago, but we'll take what we can get at this point. On Raw, the headbangers get attacked by Kaintai and Yamaguchi-san on their way to the ring, but it settles down to Togo and Teo in the ring against Mosh and Thrasher. Mosh and Togo have a little misstep here in the ring, but Al Snow, who's still at ringside, couldn't care less about this match. He shouts to Jerry Lawler that he wants to see Vince right now, and Jerry brushes pushes them off. Thrasher and Teo come in to do a little bit of work, but Thrasher tags out again so the headbangers can perform this sweet double team suplex move. No idea what to call it, but it looked good. We get more double team shenanigans from the headbangers, but Kai and Tai turn it around on the outside with some help from Funaki and Yamaguchi san. Teo performs a low blow and Togo comes in and he hits a corner springboard senton. We then see a middle rope springboard elbow drop and a senton bomb from Togo, and it comes to an end when Funaki gets in the ring, leading to Brad. Shaw and Taka once again running down to even the odds. It's a DQ finish. I really like watching Kantai in the ring right now. I just want to see more of it, and a decisive victory would also be nice. Backstage, Austin's been put in a police car, and Vince McMahon's talking to the cops. Austin looks like he wants to kill his boss right about now. The New Age Outlaws vs Rock and Owen Hart on Raw, Damien vs Juventud Guerrera on Nitro. Definitely feels like WCW are phoning this one in, and that's a shame. You can still do a lot with a 60 minute show. Before the match begins, we go back to Slamboree to hear what Dean Malenko had to say after his big victory. He says what Chris Jericho felt was just a little bit of hurt in comparison to the hurt Jericho dished out when he spoke badly about the Malenko family. Malenko watched every episode of Nitro and Thunder, and he watched Jericho get himself over with The Office and fans of WCW, but he didn't get over with Dean Malenko. Dean says Jericho's Gonna wish Malenko stayed at home, and he again dedicates his title victory to his dad. Jericho, meanwhile, is taking things rather well. He's throwing trash cans, he destroys his shrine to Dean Dean, and he screams that this is a conspiracy. Jericho is a victim of a big old conspiracy. Back in the ring, one thing I like about the cruiserweight division, usually, is how unpredictable it is in comparison to the other matches on Nitro, but this one is very predictable. It's Hoovy vs Damien. It's all Hooventude to start us off, and Damien gets a short break after hitting a clothesline. Hoovy dropkicks Damien out of the ring, but he fails to land a baseball slide, leading to Damien throwing Guerrera into the ring steps. After Landing an apron drop kick, Damien brings it back inside the ring where a calf kick makes him fall forwards into the ropes. Not sure why, but this made me laugh. Hoovy Juice goes upstairs and he delivers a diving hurricane rana that looked great, but he then gets his little juice dispenser smashed on the top rope. Damien then delivers an elevated cradle neckbreaker or a muscle buster neckbreaker, a rarely seen move in WCW and a move that made the match worth watching if I'm honest. Guerrera gets up, he hits a Hoovy driver, he then overshoots his 450 splash and Hoovy's knees drive into Damien's chest. Even Tony Schiavone can't hide that one, he flat out says Guerrera missed, but still, Hoovy covers his opponent and he wins the match via pinfall. Man, Juventud Guerrera is so hot and cold, isn't he? In one match he can put on an absolute fantastic performance, but then in the next he won't just botch, he'll botch in the most spectacular fashion possible. Over on Raw, we see footage of Paul Bearer and Kneebreaker Kane getting their DNA test done. Paul's being a big boy and Kane looks pretty pleased too with his out of character tracksuit and those sneakers on. I'm sure both guys got a lollipop for being very brave. I want to show the world that I'm Kane's daddy. <laughs> DX come to the ring and X-Pac performs a little botch of his own. I know there's a lot of wrestlers. 
WWF superstars, I should say. X-Pac says he wants to send a message to all the WWF superstars in the back. X-Pac has game. China has game. DX got game. I mean, I'm sure no one in the back really cares, but yeah, you do you. Hunter tells this audience and all us watching at home that we should all get ready to suck it. Preparation is key, folks, or so I'm told. And Triple H then says he's a great drummer. He knows how to bang his skin. The ladies can twirl on his stick while he beats on the Tom Tom. Triple H calls his little man a Tom Tom. What the hell? Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages. Shut up. Road Dog bizarrely quotes Judas Priest, you've got another thing coming, and HD Wells Dr. Maru and he says, he who breaks the law goes back to the house of pain while giggling like a schoolgirl, making it clear that certain members of DX had a good time in the back before coming out. Even Triple H says, I don't think they got that, and he was absolutely right, the crowd didn't react at all. Owen and Rock come down to the ring along with Mark Henry, D'Lo and Kama, and it's an all out brawl before the match even begins. DX and the nation tear each other apart and the match doesn't begin until after a commercial break. It's Rock and Road Dog starting things off and we see the move of the match right away when Rocky makes sure the real Double J won't be doing anything with his baby tonight. This kick in the nads leads to Road Dog taking a body slam and a people's elbow. The elbow was now starting to get better reactions. Owen and Billy get in the ring and Owen gets thrown into the turnbuckles. He comes back by raking gun in the eyes while up for a press slam and he follows this up with an enziguri. Rock then tags back in and he and Billy Gunn square up like this is some sort of Andre and Hogan moment but it's more like a, well, a Rock and Billy Gunn moment. Rock strikes first and a back elbow puts badass on the mat. Gunn knows he's no match for the IC champion so he tags out and Road Dog takes a Samoan drop. Owen jumps off the top rope with an elbow drop and he bites Road Dog's ear, the same thing he did to Triple H. So it would seem the Blackheart is now a vampire, or the Canadian Mike Tyson. In comes Rock again to take the cringe punch from Jesse James. Rock's so annoyed with this move that he performs the rock bottom. Owen and Billy Gunn then fight when Billy comes in to break up the cover, and then Farouk hits the ring while China distracts the referee. Farouk hits Rock with a pile driver, and this allows the Outlaws to retain the tag team titles. Al Snow's been getting more and more agitated while sitting at ringside, and Stone Cold's been getting more and more agitated while sitting in the cop car. After a commercial break, we learn that Steve Austin has a chance to get released, but he has to apologize to security Sam. Austin apologizes in the most aggressive way way possible. He says he's sorry for Sam being so damn stupid before flipping him off. So it looks like that street fight is back on for the Raw main event. We find out if Paul's the father next on Raw while over on Nitro, my god, Goldberg vs Glacier. Can Glacier do the unthinkable and win the US title tonight and end the streak? <laughs> no. He tries to kung fu his way to victory but Goldberg parries like Daigo playing Street Fighter 3 and Glacier gets taken down big time. Goldberg performs a dragon screw, he chokes Chili Choat on the canvas, Glacier tries to kick Goldberg in the corner but Goldberg grabs his foot, leading to Sub-Zero pulling off a little kick that makes Goldberg back up for about, I don't know, two seconds. Glacier then botches a kip up and he gets speared. Just in case you missed that, let me show you it again. One more time. There's a jackhammer and let's watch that again, keeping an eye on Nick Patrick almost braining himself when going down for the count. This victory brings Goldberg to 89-0 according to Mike Tanay. However, the reliving the war count says this is 84-0. You know something, 5 victories off isn't really that bad, is it? On Raw, Dr. Woosley's here to give us the results of the DNA test. It's like an episode of Jerry Springer. Double K Kevin Kelly wants to know who fathered the big red machine and absolutely, 100%, no questions asked, definitely, without a shadow of a doubt, Paul Bearer doinked Mummy Taker. Paul Bearer is Kane's daddy. Paul and Kane head to the ring and Paul says he's not the boy who hollered woof, he's the fat man who tells the truth. Paul told Undertaker Kane was alive and Paul told Undertaker he porked his mom <laughs> and the proof is in the pudding. Taker needs to understand something, something that Kane has already accepted. Mummy Taker was nothing but a two bit a two bit I can't say anything on this channel without getting destroyed by YouTube but the word rhymes with chore and Mummy Taker wanted more more more, let's just say that. She was uh, uh, 
she was a stinking prosy, alright, there. Upon hearing this news, The Undertaker hits the ring and he throws down with his little brother. Hall gets a punch in the face too before Taker hits Kane with a choke slam, but then Taker gets too focused on dishing out more punishment to Kane's daddy. This allows Kane to get up and hit Taker with a choke slam, and just when all hope was lost, Big Van Vader hits the ring and he goes straight after Kane. Taker chases Paul back up the ramp, Vader ends up clotheslining Kane out of the ring, and Kane decides to go help his daddy. Remember, we have a mask vs mask match coming up at Over the Edge between Kane and Vader. Alright, so it's the end of our shows unfortunately, but again, we'll be back to normal next week. We've got the Steve Austin street fight next on Raw, while over on Nitro we end with two promos, one from DDP and another from Hollywood Hogan. Mean Gene wants to know how DDP continues to have matches like the one he had at Slamboree last night, and why does he continue to do it? Dallas quotes Dick Murdoch when he says, If I had to think about how I did this, I don't know if I could. But DDP knows why he does it every night. He wrestles because he loves it and he does it for the people. All the people out here that jack me up! Wait, what? He does it for the people who jack him up? Oh, he said jack me up. I thought he said jack me. Uh, never mind. DDP says, It's time to go after the world belt, and yes, I would 100% agree. DDP hopes Holly. Hollywood Hogan still champion when Paige gets his shot because Paige hasn't forgotten what Hollywood and the NWO have did to him over the past 15 months or so. Looks like Hollywood Hogan might be next to feel the bang and again, I'm all for it seeing as Bret Hart's opportunity seems to be flushed down the toilet. Hogan and NWO Hollywood come out for a promo next. Pay attention to Bret Hart getting in and refusing to shake hands with Vincent, and also take note of Bret not wearing NWO colours and sitting as far away as possible from the group. Hogan says NWO Hollywood is the supreme par in pro wrestling and the fact he still has the soldiers behind him means that Kevin Nash was wrong. Hogan still has a loyal NWO faction and he still has loyal NWOites in the arena. I noticed something pretty early on too, Eric Bischoff's getting really anxious about the airtime. Nitro only has around 3 minutes left and there's still a lot to get through so things start getting really rushed. After whispering to Hogan that he needs to hurry up, Hollywood introduces Kevin Nash's former best friend, the newest member of Hogan's new family, Scott Hall. Scott doesn't get a chance to cut a promo, Eric whispers to Scott that there's no survey tonight Chico, and Eric then tells Sting to come down to the ring and make his decision. Is Sting going to finally join the NWO seeing as he's now a tag team champion along with the giant? Sting walks out, he spits on the giant at the entranceway, so the giant launches an attack and it looks like Sting's done for. That is until the giant killer walks out to even the odds and Nitro then fades to black. Clearly, there was supposed to be more to this. I think Hall was supposed to cut a promo and Sting was to make it all the way down to the ring before Nash made the save, but that's how Nitro ends this week. Watch it back and you'll see what I mean. On Raw, Patterson and Briscoe make their way down to the ring. The Stooges are going to face Stone Cold, so Mr. McMahon isn't involved. Al Snow stands beside this guy here, who doesn't look suspicious at all. And it's also announced here that Commissioner Slaughter is going to referee this Raw main event. Briscoe wears a sweater advertising the Briscoe Bros Body Shop, and Jim Ross says Jerry works with a lot of rear ends, so give Briscoe a call if you need your rear end fixed. Austin flips off Commissioner Slaughter and that was a mistake. Slaughter hits Austin from behind and then the Stooges start attacking Stone Cold right away. The offense is a bit sloppy, not gonna lie, but we're all just waiting for Stone Cold to start fighting back. Patterson pulls out what looks like some tape and he puts it around his knuckles. He punches Stone Cold and the rattlesnake hits the mat. Slaughter then performs a fast count but Austin still kicks out and we then see Stone Cold on offense. Briscoe gets thrown out of the ring and Pat Patterson gets his nuts smashed on the top rope. Pat does get a chance to fight back but he misses a bronco buster while also smacking his head on the canvas. And from here, it's all Austin just having fun with these two guys. Briscoe takes an interesting Stone Cold stunner bump and I thought Patterson's looked way better, but there's no time to appreciate stunner bumps because Sergeant Slaughter's locked in the Cobra Clutch. Thankfully, Austin kicks Sarge away and there we go, another Stone Cold stunner. Mick Foley hits the ring and Stone Cold takes him out with a clothesline. Another clothesline sends Dude Love out of the ring, and on the outside, Mick slips on a spilled drink. That dude wearing the Steve Austin mask then attacks Dude Love. There isn't a security guard in sight because Security Sam is still out of action, but we all know who this is, right? 
Creepy Steve Austin then attacks the real Steve Austin with a steel chair. He reveals himself as Mr. McMahon as Stone Cold retaliates, but this allows Mick Foley to fire back at Austin and Stone Cold takes the mandible claw. Raw goes off the air with Mr. McMahon getting one up on Stone Cold Steve Austin. No doubt about it this week, Raw was better than Nitro, so the WWF wins this week's episode of Reliving the War. The WWF did a great job of telling a contained story this week with Austin breaking into the arena and getting arrested. The DX vs Nation tag team match was alright too and, as a matter of fact, I think the only thing I didn't care much for this week was the DOA vs LOD tag team match. A one hour Nitro felt more like an inconvenience for WCW this week and they didn't really try all that hard with the matches they booked, but I'm forever grateful for Goldberg vs Glacier. Raw has 64 points on our leaderboard, Nitro has 55 and we've got 15 ties. In the TV ratings, Raw beat Nitro with a 4.3 rating, Nitro got a 2.5. Next week on Raw, the Jackal reveals a brand new stable to WWF audiences. DX have another mission in their quest to bring down WCW, and Steve Austin has a big surprise in store for Vince McMahon. On Nitro, we get to see more glacier abuse. Nice. We also see Goldberg facing his doppelganger in the middle of the ring, and the critically acclaimed Best of Seven series begins between Chris Benoit and Booker T. Thanks for watching, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Reliving the War, and take care.